If you're fortunate, you'll one day contend with the realities of aging. And if you're wise, you'll heed the best advice about how to do so in good health, keeping your wits sharp. Neuroscientist Daniel Levitin, whose previous books include This Is Your Brain on Music and The Organized Mind, offers just such counsel in his new book. It's called Successful Aging. He is Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Neuroscience at McGill University, and Daniel Levitin joins us now on some of the distinct advantages, yes, advantages, of the aging brain and how to make the most of them. So good to have you back in that chair. Great to be here. We've had you with your previous books here, and you're always so uh, provocatively fascinating, so we're glad to have you back. You have written a book on music. You have written a book on the brain, as we indicated, uh, another on information overload, and now old age. Old age. Daniel, my first question is obvious. Aren't you too young to have written this book? <laughs> well, uh, actually, the way I see the book is that, you know, we, we start aging at age one. Uh, aging is mm -hmm. something that inevitably happens if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, it's everybody's favorite alternative to dying. So um, really what I imagine the book as is a, a life story of the brain from beginning to end and the ways we age. And yeah, there's a bit of a focus on what happens after 70, but mostly because there's so many myths about that. Well, this is it. Where did you begin to get the notion that everything we had thought about getting older is actually wrong? Well, I didn't go into it with that notion. I just, I surrounded myself with the, the scientific literature. I read about 4,000 papers, peer-reviewed papers, so that you wouldn't have to. Thank you. I'm grateful. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, but they're all listed in the appendix mm -hmm. if you want to. And uh, what are the main questions that you're trying to answer in this book now? I really just wanted to understand how the brain changes across the lifespan and uh, in the various different uh, ways that are meaningful to us, memory, uh, intelligence, pain perception, uh, personality, things like that, visual perception, auditory perception. And um, in reading through the papers, it became clear to me I held a bunch of misconceptions um, and uh, as, as did the general public. And so it shifted my focus from just telling the story to trying to explode some myths and uncover that the idea which is that old age isn't simply, you're not simply an older, less well-functioning version of your younger <laughs> self. Like adolescence or middle age, it's a distinctive developmental phase with both advantages and, and disadvantages. Well, my mother's 83, and if I've heard her say it once, I've heard her say it a hundred times, getting older is not for sissies. And you've heard the expression too. I'm, and when I saw the title of your book, Successful Aging, of course, the first thing that goes through your head is, boy, that's an oxymoron. But when you think of successful aging, who are the role models that pop into your head? Well, to me, I want to be clear that by successful aging, I don't mean getting rich or getting famous. Mm -hmm. To me, successful aging is being able to stay engaged with life um, as long as possible, to derive pleasure from the things that have traditionally given you pleasure and find new things that are enjoyable, to remain meaningful, valued in your community, to feel that you have a sense of purpose. And those things are important at any age, but we have a faulty societal narrative, I think. That, in what way? Well, that. After a certain age, we, we think of older adults as irrelevant or not capable. And you ask about role models, there are so many out there. Just one of them is my new hero. Go ahead. Have you heard of Julia Hurricane Hawkins? Tell us. Retired school teacher from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She's a 103-year-old mm. competitive runner <laughs> who just took gold medals in the senior games, broke two world records, and didn't take up competitive running till she was, uh, uh, until she was 100. <laughs> now, talk about rewriting your own life hmm. story, right? You know, or, or being able to find new things to do and stay relevant. My hunch is, though, people who hear that story say, yeah, that's her, and that's a one-off. And for the rest of us, the rest of us are going to experience what most of us experience, which is, as we get older, we're going to start to be more forgetful. We are going to be cognitively less sharp. We are going to slow down. Is that the whole story? It's really not. There is a slowing, and there's a neural basis for this. I know you, you love talking about the science as much as I do. Um, your neurons have to transmit information from one to another, and they do so with electrical pulses. And they're insulated, just like the wires in your house. 
And that insulation is called myelin. It's a white fatty substance. Mm -hmm. It's why we call it white matter. Uh, and um, as you get older, your ability to make myelin decreases just a bit, and so we slow down. But a number of compensatory neural mechanisms kick in. Although we're slower at that, uh, we're much better at solving a range of problems particularly those that require pattern matching, seeing patterns in disparate events or circumstances and saying, oh yeah, that reminds me of that. I can solve this problem the way that problem was solved. We're better at predicting outcomes as we get older. Every decade after 60, we get better at this. So that explains why in the book you say, if you're sick and you need to go see a radiologist, you want the 70-year-old radiologist as opposed to the 30-year-old radiologist. Absolutely, the 70-year-old had so much more experience reading those fuzzy gray images on a, a, a film or a computer screen now, mm -hmm. um, you want, by the same token, if you need surgery, you want the person who's done it 5,000 times, not the person who says, well, yeah, I, I did that, I saw it done in medical school, <laughs> and I've done it five or six times myself. I, I'm always learning. Fine, you, you go learn on someone else. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Experience is something that takes time to acquire but there are also neural changes that cause older adults to be more facile at accessing and pulling together those experiences. There does come a point, though, for every surgeon where they say, my hands shake too much, uh, you know, I can't be on my feet for 12 hours a day anymore. You gotta know where the sweet spot is, presumably, right? Between experience and You do, although with, with robotic surgery now and the da Vinci method, mm. that's becoming less yeah. important, but there is a role for older surgeons to be standing next to those young, younger women and men and saying, don't cut there. Yes. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> I now, did that once and it didn't work out <laughs> it well. Didn't, it didn't turn out well. Um, I mean, it is an empirically provable fact that we do get more forgetful as we get older. I mean, that is, uh, I know, uh, look at, uh, having read this and having saw you, seen your column in the New York Times, I know you're gonna fight with me on that, but, uh -huh. <laughs> but the fact is, but the fact is, we are more forgetful of names and things and dates and places and all of that stuff as we get older. Is that not, in fact, the case? Well, uh, let's unpack this. There's yeah. a couple of parts to it. Uh, one is that, uh, compare, compare yourself to a 20-year-old, for example. I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have the greatest job in the world as a professor. I see a new crop of 20-year-olds, mm -hmm. 18, 20-year-olds every year. 20-year-olds are very forgetful, Steve. They lose their cell phones. They forget mm -hmm. their computer passwords. They show up in the wrong place. Uh, and, you know, 70-year-olds forget their computer passwords and lose their cell phones, and they show up in the wrong place. The difference is the stories we tell ourselves. Well, I, okay, let me push back on that again. The 20-year-old who, who loses their computer and forgets the password and all that, th that, it could be suggested that that's as a result of having just a scattered mind because they're so young. Whereas an older person had the information, knew the information, has had that information potentially in their brain for 50 years. And Not where their cell phone was or what their computer True. was. No, fair enough, fair enough. But for some reason can't access or has, has a longer time accessing that information from the memory banks. Now that is a fact, yes? Part of this has to do with the stories we tell ourselves. So the 20 year old says, I gotta get more sleep or I drank too much beer last night. The 70 year old says, I've got Alzheimer's. And then the 70 year old starts worrying releases a cortisol spike, which shuts down the memory system. Mm -hmm. And so there's partly this stress response. And in addition to that, the 70-year-old has a lot more to remember. The fact is, yeah, we have, I, I concede the point, as we age, every decade after 50, we have a harder time retrieving words and especially names, mm -hmm. but they're in there. We yes. eventually get them. And it suggests that there's a bottleneck that's being caused, and if you just release your grip and not stress about it, don't let the cortisol spike, namaste, <laughs> serenity now, it'll come to you. you. You got me in the zone now. Are we doing it with the fingers here? Yeah. Um, mm. I got some numbers on this You know this the stuff. electrician's favorite meditation? Tell me. Um. Uh, very good, very good. Uh, in the book, you do note that from the age of 30 to 71, our reaction time slows by 1 25th of a second every year. So, how does the speed at which our brains are processing things relate to how intelligent we are? Well, so that's a good question. Uh, we're less, we're, we're slower. Uh, there's more stuff in there. Um, 
Think of it as a hard disk that's getting full and it takes longer to access stuff. It's still there, um, but I, I, I wouldn't say that our intelligence falls, but different aspects of our intelligence reach a peak. Um, our ability to acquire new information may slow down as we age, but our ability to use creatively and innovatively the life experience of information we've collected, that actually uh, accelerates as we get older. Can you explain this phenomenon? I once interviewed somebody who had remarkable details on what percentage of this business deal he went in for and the location of where the negotiations took place and et cetera, et cetera, but has completely lost names, doesn't remember names anymore. How does that kind of selective difficulty happen when, when you've got so much brilliance on one side of the ledger but almost a complete loss of an ability to recall names on the other. Well, so it's an interesting point. Uh, names, we believe, are stored in a different part of the brain than other things. Uh, and, but actually, not to get pedantic, but uh, um, the, some of the interesting things are in the details. Most people, when they say they forget names, they don't actually have trouble remembering the name. It's the name they know. It's Steve or Bill or George or Carolyn or, or, or Kate or Marcy. Uh, they just can't attach it to a face, right? Yeah. They see the face and they don't know what name goes with it, but you know, they know the name. So uh, that, that, that linking, some people are really great at it. That's what they do, like Bill Clinton, right. for example. Other people, it was never that important to them. And other people, as they age, that part of the brain may selectively atrophy while the other parts stay yeah. vivid. Gotcha. Let's talk personality. Here's a quote from the book. The single biggest determinant of living a productive and happy life is something that you're born with, partly, and something that you can decide to change, your personality. What is the relationship between personality type and how we successfully age? Well, so uh, personality, of course, is the thousands of ways we differ from one another. Uh, are we stingy? Are we generous? Are we um, easy to get along with or difficult? Are we emotionally stable or unstable? Uh, and there are a few factors, I'll name just uh, three or four, that have an outsized influence on the course of your life at every stage. The first one is conscientiousness. Uh, and you're, you're partly born with it. Some kids are more conscientious in the sandbox about mm -hmm. picking up their little shovels and pails than others. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you can, the, the good news here is that you can change your personality at any age. It's never too late. Um, and conscientiousness, of course, is so important because if you're conscientious, you don't cross against the light. So you're not going to get hit by a truck. Uh, you don't end up in prison because you followed at least some, some you know, societal rules. Uh, you, you set a little bit of money aside so you're not broke when you're old and you uh, see the doctor when something goes wrong. That's conscientiousness. Uh, a couple others, um, curiosity. Mm. Having a, a personality that's curious, wondering when you walk in the forest, what kind of bird is that? What kind of tree is that? Or meeting somebody new and wanting to get to know them. That makes a happier life and a more mentally active life. That keeps your brain tuned. And a, a third factor is resilience. You, you can't control to a large degree what happens to you in the world, but you can control how you react to it. And resilience strategies are very important. Now, you did say at the beginning of that answer that you can change your personality as you go through life. And I don't know if you've seen those Michael Abted documentaries, Seven Up, which basically he followed this group of kids from overseas. Seven Up. Yeah. Not Dr. Pepper. Correct. Seven Up. He followed this group of kids. We're doing shtick here instead of neuroscience, but anyway. Uh, you speak softly, but carry a big stick. <laughs> ah, there you go. You know, we got to go to, we got to take you onto the Borscht Belt one of these days. Uh, he, he looked at this group of young people from the time they were seven and up, and every seven years he revisited them. And it was amazing how the children at seven were essentially the same people, same personalities, same issues, same difficulties throughout their life, and he, and he followed them into their 60s, I think. But your view is you can change personality um, it's not baked in from the age of seven? It's not. Of course, the whole field of psychotherapy is based on this. Uh, but that's not the only route to personality change. Uh, 
For some, it's meditation. This is what the Dalai Lama is all about and his followers. It's learning to become more compassionate, more tolerant, and express more gratitude. Um, religion, of course, teaches that we can change ourselves at any age. The Catholics say you can, you can ask for forgiveness at the very end. Become a, 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 a person who uh, admits your faults. And then there are drugs. Uh, I mean, it, it's important not to leave out the medical side, which is that as we get older, um, our neurochemical processes become less efficient. Partic take dopamine. We we're talking about curiosity. Yep. You have to have a healthy amount of dopamine to feel curious, to want to uh, explore the world. Your dopamine can deplete when you get older. If you take a dopamine enhancer, an agonist, you can restore your sense of curiosity. And dopamine also helps with conscientiousness. Serotonin helps with uh, feelings of gratitude and compassion. So what we're seeing is uh, older adults who, who want to change sometimes do it through drugs. You mentioned the word compassion. Let's follow up on that. Do you want to tell the story of your friend Peter? Yeah. Good time for that? How did you hear about that story? Well, you know, we, we have our sources. research team. We have our sources. So I have a friend named Peter Himmelman, who's a, a great singer-songwriter, uh, has some records out. And he and I were in New York City a couple of weeks ago. I was playing a show, presenting my new CD, mm -hmm. at a club in Manhattan. And Peter came by, because we're doing a song that we uh, had written together. Afterwards, we're, tr we're standing on the platform of the subway, waiting for the F train. Uh, and a homeless guy comes up to us. And on the, the scale of homelessness, this guy was the kind that I think even Mother Teresa or the Dalai Lama would back away from. Trouble, eh? I won't go into detail. He just, uh, his, his odor preceded him and his, his downcastness preceded him. But Peter, who's been studying uh, mystical Judaism and the Kabbalah and takes to heart the teaching that you, more important than believing or loving God is loving your fellow human, uh, leaned into him and started talking to him. And the guy talked. Peter said, after about a minute, he said, Sir, he said, I can't hear your words, but I feel them. And the guy stood up a little taller. And then um, Peter took out the guitar I had been playing at the gig. And he says, may I write a song for you? He says, what's your name? And the guy says, Dyrell. Peter starts writing a song, not just some simple thing, a very complicated song, complicated chords. Uh, we're here at the F train. I met a man named Dyrell. Uh, I can see by his coat that he's not doing so well. And the lyrics got more and more elaborate. And at one point, at, you know, now, you know, Dyrell is just beaming like a six-year-old in a kindergarten classroom where the teacher goes around and pays attention to everyone and compliments everyone and builds up. Dyrell is just beaming. You just see that his whole demeanor has changed. He doesn't look like an anonymous homeless person. He looks like a dignified human being. And then Peter starts singing, I can see you're a man with dignity. You deserve our respect. It's something you need, but not something you get. Darrell was transformed. Uh, when he left us, he was, he was walking with pride. Hmm. We gave him a few dollars, but um, that compassion, uh, I have to admit, here to a, an audience even, I'm not sure I have the courage or the compassion to do what Peter did, but what a great model. And what a great story. Good. I want to touch on something that we, we, we just mentioned very briefly earlier, but let's come back to it. And let's quote the great Jane Goodall, who's been in this studio and who is an octogenarian and still. 89. Okay. When I talked to her a couple of months ago, she was in between flights between Tanzania and India. As they say, she's still kicking ass and taking names. Yeah. Uh, OK, here's the line. People who retire fade rather fast unless they have something really important they want to do. It's feeling that you have purpose and that you have less and less time to make your mark. Instead of slowing down, you have to speed up. OK, why shouldn't people retire? We, all, you know, we go through life thinking, let's put our 35, 40 years in whatever, and we can't wait to get to retirement so we can do whatever we want. Wrong, right? Well, it, it, look, if you're in a stressful job or a dangerous job, yes, by all means, retire. But if you're going to retire from something, retire to something else. Um, having that sense of purpose that Jane talked about or that um, 
Julia Hurricane Hawkins has in, in you know, breaking records for 100-year-olds, or that Peter Hibbelman has in reaching out to humans and feeling that he is just one of seven billion people, the Dalai Lama's teaching as well. That sense of purpose actually strengthen, strengthens your immune system. Uh, having, uh, it, it opens up uh, neural pathways of gratitude. And um, the problem with retirement is it typically shrinks our social circles. And the most neurally protective thing you can do, the most complex cognitive operation we know of, is just what you and I are doing right now, having a conversation face-to-face, -face, face, not on Skype, face-to-face. Mm -hmm. -face. And retirement, uh, unless you're doing something with a purpose, those conversations dwindle. You are, am I allowed to say how old you are? Sure. You're 62 years old, and I wonder... 10 years older than you. <laughs> I wish. Just a couple, I'm afraid. Did writing this book change how you think about the next chapter of your life that you are about to embark upon? Well, it did. Uh, in putting together the, the research, I went in with no hypothesis. I was just trying to follow whatever story the data told. And it became clear to me that after the age of 60, for neurostructural and neurochemical reasons, complacency sets in. We want to keep going to the same restaurant that we like and order the same dish we like. We want to just spend time with the people we know we like. I've started talking to people online at the supermarket. Barb Fredrickson, uh, who I went to graduate school with at Stanford, has shown that l these micro contacts during the day, talking to your postal carrier, the, the shopkeeper, the, the dry cleaner, these make an enormous difference in your feeling of connection to the world. In some cases, more than having a spouse or a best friend to talk to, because it expands your world. So I've started to do that, and I've pushed myself out of my comfort zone in a couple of ways. One is I took flying lessons, because I'm afraid of heights, in an airport at Saint-Hubert. Uh, what are you flying? Uh, Cessna, uh, 185 and uh, 212 and cool. 206. And um, the other thing is, as, as we've talked about before, I've been in music all my life, but in very much in the background, mm -hmm. out of the spotlight, often in a control room. The thought of putting myself front and center, writing my own songs and singing them just terrified me because mm -hmm. I didn't want to be bad at it. And I'm, I wasn't accustomed to being in the spotlight. And so I, I decided that the first thing I should do is, is check whether I have reasonable expectations. So I checked with Joni Mitchell and Paul Simon, played them some of what I had, and they, they encouraged me. Joni actually, and Paul both gave me some structural ideas about how to edit. They said, you know how to edit books, you know how to edit articles, editing music's different. These are the kinds of things you want to be thinking about. And I brought the songs back to Joni, and she said, yeah, that's it. Now I'm going to teach you how to sing them. <laughs> Very good. We got a minute left here. Can I ask you to tell us a little joke about an old couple? Well, I do want to preface it by saying that uh, this is a myth, that this doesn't really happen. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's illustrative of the kind of societal myths we tell about aging. An older couple are having memory problems. And they go to the doctor, and he does all kinds of tests. And he finds out that, well, they, the brain scans are fine, and uh, there's nothing structurally wrong. He says, what, you, what I want you to do is write down everything. Just write everything down to help you remember things. So they agree. They go home. They're sitting on the couch. Uh, and the wife says to her husband, she says, dear, would you mind getting up and, and getting me a scoop of ice cream from the kitchen? He says, sure, no problem. He's just getting up. And she says, oh, oh by the way, put on some, some chocolate syrup, too, while you're at it. He says, sure. She says, write it down. He says, I don't have to write it down. It's a scoop of ice cream and chocolate syrup. She says, the doctor said to write it down. He said, sweetie, I'm not incapacitated. I'm not an invalid. I'm not a baby. I can remember this. Scoop of ice cream, chocolate syrup. He gets to the kitchen door, and she says, oh, and some whipped cream, too. There's a can of whipped cream in the door of the fridge. Write it down. He says, I'm not going to write it down. I got this. That's ridiculous. He comes back 15 minutes later with a plate of scrambled eggs. She looks at it, and she says, honey, you forgot the toast. <laughs> I like that story. That's good. Uh, more of that kind of wisdom and brilliance in Daniel J. Levitin's book, Successful Aging, a neuroscientist explores the power and potential of our lives. So good to see you again. Thanks a lot. You too. Thank you, Steve.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.